Right now, he's only 10 days old. My little dog. Ain't nobody touching this. Ain't nobody touching this. Not even close. Ain't, ain't, ain't nobody touching this. <laughs> I'm more than ready to be the king of the division. I have to figure out how to take Brian Castano away from being Brian Castano. This is the real deal here. All access to Jermel Charlo versus Brian Castano, Friday, July 9th at 8.30 on Showtime. DraftKings, the official gaming partner of the USC, is putting you in the center of the action with a shot at over a million dollars in total prizes for UFC 264. UFC 264 is going to be a great card. You have Poirier versus McGregor 3, Burns versus Wonderboy, plus Sean O'Malley returning to the cage. I'm excited to see who gets the win, Matt, in this trilogy fight between Poirier and McGregor. The last fight was awesome. Get into all the action with DraftKings. Download the app, use the code SMOKE during sign-up, and enter their fantasy MMA contest for UFC 264. Over $1 million in total prizes on the line with this one. Tell them how to play, Matt. It's easy, Jack. Draft six fighters from Saturday's card. Stay under the salary cap, rack up fantasy points for advances, takedowns, knockdowns, and more. Don't miss this one. Download the DraftKings app, use promo code SMOKE to get a shot at $1 million in total prizes for UFC 264. Over $1 million on the line. Sign up for DraftKings with promo code SMOKE. Eligibility restrictions apply. See DraftKings.com for more details. Welcome back to All the Smoke. Good. Jose, it's been, a, better. it's been a good day. It's, it's about to get even better. Even man, better. we have the legendary Ice Cube in the building today. Cube, appreciate you, man. Yeah, yeah. What's yeah. happening, man? How you Legend feeling? Legend in the building. Brother, man. We Shit. just, you know what I mean? Just trying to track you down and know you're busy man. So, man, so we appreciate your time. 2020, obviously a very difficult time for our country, uh, our, the world. Uh, what is, what's something you took from 2020? You know, same shit, different toilet. Mm. It's ugly. You know, when you know all the deck is stacked against you. Right. And and you make it known and you point it out and you make your case and nothing changes because, mm. you know, same people that, that got you in this position is the same people that, uh, you need to make the changes. Mm. So it's, uh, you know, same, like I said, same shit, different toilet. And I know it's extensive, but kind of give us the cliff notes with your uh, contract with Black America and what it, what, what's that really about? Well, it's just about, you know, after, um, you know, a lot of the protests, a lot of people were screaming really what needs to be done. There's a lot that need to be done. Mm -hmm. And I was... You know, just I couldn't find the document that really said, hey, these are all the problems right now. And here's some suggestions to move us forward. So I said, well, let's, you know, I, I, I've tried to find the smartest people I know and uh, said, let's create this document where the average Joe, anybody can look at this and see the wide range of problems that need to be solved and get in where you fit in. You know, if you mm. feel like you can do something on uh, police brutality, jump in there. You feel like you can do something on voting rights, jump in there. Uh, banking, uh, venture capitalists, um, you could just jump in where you fit in because these are the wide range of problems. So that was really what the contract with Black America was about. It's, it's just a foundation. It's just a forever growing right. document that, you know, today if you came with a better idea for section four, we would plug it in. We would plug it in mm -hmm. and fill it in because we want the experts to step up and help us perfect this document. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I just wanted something that anybody can look at, college kid, grown folks, anybody, and say, oh, this is why mm -hmm. we're in this position. It's not just us. Mm -hmm. It's not just the same old narrative that, you know, black people can't handle our own affairs. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? That's just not true. Right. It's uh, it's systematic, and, you know, you would have to be blind not to know that. Since you came on the scene, something you've always been about is, is pro your people. That's what you stood for from day one. So when the stuff around the election happened with 
the Trump team, the Biden team, and you took a lot of heat. It bothered me because, like I said, I've been a fan of you for, since I was young. And the one thing that stands out to me the most is you've always been for the people. So when that kind of shit hit the airwave and the way social media plays with it and, and does what they do, how did that make you feel? And, and what actually happened? I mean, it's it's kind of scary when your history don't matter. <laughs> Crazy, you know, right? It's like no matter how long you've been a stand-up dude, you know, the minute somebody sees something you don't like or you say something somebody don't like, you know, they throw you away. Mm -hmm. But I wasn't really worried about that. You know, I knew that once I studied the problem that black people are a pawn in this game. You know, we're political football. And people use our emotions and our uh, passion, uh, our, our fight for justice to get other issues and things solved and, and not necessarily our issues and our things, but it's always piggybacked or our movements are hijacked mm -hmm. in ways. So knowing that, I know that neither party is the answer. Totally. It's a problem that both parties created, and it's a problem that both parties got to solve. Mm. You won't, you know, it's not fair to put it on one side or the other. Right. You know, it's not fair to us. You know, this is a an, a, an American problem across the board, so it need to be dealt with like that. Um, it's a bipartisan issue. Uh, so I wasn't going to let that stop me, you know, how people feel. You know, I know black people all lean Democrat. Uh, or mostly. So I wasn't going to let that stop me from trying to shake this, um, you know, like I said, this stalemate of, of our progress, you know, with, with opinions, you, you know, well, some people promise us the world or don't promise us en enough and don't deliver. And then some people, you know, on the Republican side, I feel like they off the hook that they don't, you know, that's a Democrat problem. We don't mm -hmm. have to deal with that. And it's just not true. No matter who's the president, we still in the same position. Right. So mm -hmm. it's, it's a thing where, you know, what I would want us to do as a people is to become independent, mm -hmm. not to vote independent, but to hold our vote and say, okay, Democrat X, do something for it. You get it or Republican X, do something for it, you get it. But, you know, this whole, you know, way we've been going has just not been working. I kind of compared it to to the Jay-Z situation when everyone jumped on him for working with the, with the NFL. But to me, if you have a seat at the table, you have a, a an actual opportunity to affect the, the outcome. Mm -hmm. And no matter what situation we're, like you said, your track record speaks for itself. So whether whatever situation it is, you're for us and you have a voice and a seat at the table. So like I said, to me, that bothered me. I commend you for kind of standing because sometimes standing for what's right or, or, or standing on a strong opinion isn't the popular and it ain't easy, but you've been dealing with the kind of negativity and hatred your whole life. So you're a pro at it, but uh, we just want to say, we definitely respect your, your pace because when you and I talked about your plan with black America, we didn't end up linking because we both got super busy, but definitely proud of it and, and, and want to continue to push forward with the mission. Yeah, I mean, it's something you can use to this day. I mean, anybody can go take a look at it and figure out, you know, from their vantage point or from their, you know, um, angle, how they can, you know, try to solve this problem. You know, nobody has the answers because right. it's a it's a complex problem that um, that sometimes, you know, creates its own weather mm -hmm. you know it's like <clears throat> it's a, it's a it's a bad situation pivoting um lifelong laker fan uh big big showtime laker fan um champion absolutely Los Angeles Lakers. yeah talk to him 2020 yeah man thank you you know what yeah. I mean? <laughs> you, made, you, you made the year worth living for that real you know it's like you know until that happened i was like man it's got to be the worst Man, year ever. Uh, ever. So, um, you know, the Lakers, the Dodgers was, you know, my, and I didn't want nobody to play. You know, I know people, if they watch me on, on um, social media, I was like, man, we don't need to play nothing. You know what I'm saying? We That's just what need Jack to was. Yeah, focus we was. on the mission at hand. Um, 
But at the end of the day, you know, uh, I'm glad they played and give people a little bit of relief, man, because, you know, what 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 we've been doing is giving a lot of energy to, neg- to negativity. Yeah, yeah, that shit is draining, and, too. And the negativity has sucked our energy, and we've been giving too much energy to the negativity, and we got to give way more energy to positive things. And so, you know, that's the reality of it because with every effect, you got a a, a reaction. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? It's it's like you 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 got to make sure that you know one thing is going to cause another. You know what I'm saying? So whatever, whatever you got a reaction, a action, you got a reaction. Oh, yeah, sure. I get that shit right. You know, I went to. Uh, the LA Unified School District. So, but you also got your degree. You also got a college degree. Don't blame them if I'm fucking this up. (laughs) 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 But, but yeah, you know. So, giving all that energy to the negativity to the beast is making the beast stronger. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about just when when did your journey with the Lakers start? Obviously, uh, you know, I'm from California, so I grew up, even though I was in Northern California, I grew up a uh, Showtime, Magic Johnson, Laker fan. What do you uh, mean, when did it start? It started from the womb. Yeah. It started from, from conception. Mm-hmm. It was in you. Blood was Shit, in you. Yeah, man. I mean, now it was a purple sperm that hit the egg. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> I was like, when did it start? I don't understand that question. From jump. <laughs> I don't remember when it, I wasn't a Laker yeah, fan, mm-hmm. yeah, you know. Um, yeah. But, you know, seriously, like, when I was 10 years old, my brother sat me down. He was like, yo, I want you to watch this dude. I was just getting into basketball because they was just letting me play. You know, my backyard was some of the most ferocious basketball games. It's like prison ball. Yeah. You know, so and they were starting to let me play. I was getting strong enough and good enough. And um, he said, I want you to watch this dude. And we watched, it was my first time watching Magic Johnson play Larry Bird in that championship game. And, um, you know, I I, I wanted Magic to win. You know what I mean? He was the cooler dude. Mm -hmm. So, (laughs) you know, a few months later, he come get me from outside. He said, guess who's a Laker? Mm -hmm. Nowhere in the world I was thinking he was going to say Magic Johnson. So when he said Magic Johnson, something just erupted in me you know what i mean it was just like i was glued and locked in and then that team going to win the championship mm-hmm. i was done i don't know how you could get me back from that <laughs> what are some of those uh early we actually had genie bus on the show the other day what are some th- some of the things you remember from that that showtime era and, and what it meant to the city before magic johnson it seemed like basketball was like a job it's like everybody was mad, it seemed like. And it seemed like this dude brought in, like, the fun, the way we played, the, you know, the the pointing and the smiling and, like, you know, just the energy mm-hmm. felt like, it felt like our street. You know, I grew up on a street called Van Wick. We had a lot of boys on our street. It was very athletic street. So we had fun playing. So to see the Lakers now having fun, playing, running at a Showtime fast break mm. st- style, it just was uh, electric, man. You know, it just was. You know, I was glued to that team. To me, it was like, and I didn't live too far from the form, mm. you know, uh, and so just being able to drive past that form sometime. You know, I used to drive past that to basketball practice. And um, just knowing that that my favorite team played right there, you know, it was just uh, I felt lucky to be, you know, in L.A. and a Laker fan at that time. Be a part of it. Yeah. Fast forwarding into the kind of Kobe and Shaq era, uh, you know, the, the, the next great run that the Lakers team had. Um Thoughts on that team, and you know they were able to capture five championships. They probably, obviously, could have captured more if they stayed together. But just how amazing was it seeing day in, day out, Shaq and Kobe play for your team? I mean, seeing them at that form, like the form is so intimate. Um, you know, you could hear my voice yelling at the refs. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so uh, it, it 
it was just magical to get Shaq. It was like, oh, damn. I, I just couldn't believe the Lakers pulled that off. You know, I, I've seen the Lakers pull off stuff, you know, like, uh, you know, McAdoo and, you know, these players that you'd be like, damn, we got him to make us better. And, mm -hmm. But to get Shaq was like, I guess it's, it's how it felt when they got Kareem. You know, I wasn't really hip when they got Kareem, but it was it was remarkable. And so I'm there to see Shaq and my wife say, did you hear about the young kid we got? And I'm like, nah. And he look, she like, we got a young kid, 18. I'm like, 18? I'm like, is he seven foot tall? Because if he ain't seven foot, he ain't going to make it. Because back then, right, it was, it was like big. you had to be a big to come mm -hmm. out of high school. Mm -hmm. And um, he came in the game, and uh, he got loose and, and, and dunked. And I just told my wife, I said, you know, we ain't never had nothing like that. Mm -hmm. I just like, we ain't never had nothing like that. So I was just on Kobe, you know, even though we had Shaq, I'm, I'm just locked in on Kobe and just seeing his progression as a pro. And I'm yelling, Dale Harris, put him in, put in Kobe, put in Kobe. I'm yelling, you know what I'm saying? Cause Dale Harris was just keep this kid on the bench mm -hmm. all game. I'm like, damn man, come on naked gun. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> Come on, naked gun, get him in there. <laughs> oh, shit. What's your most memorable live performance by Kobe? It got to be the comeback um, when his seventh game. Portland? Portland. Um, you know, I was in the suite uh, with the homie K-Mac, and we, we like, how did we? How did this happen to us? We in there reading the uh, the eulogy. Like how we in the fourth quarter? <laughs> in the fourth quarter, we losing by fifteen, seventeen, mm -hmm. and we just looking at each other, saying, "How did this happen, man?" And I'm like, "I'm just gonna watch the rest of the game." I'm like watching, and you know that comeback. You start to feel that energy, momentum mm -hmm. switch, and. And I started doing the calculations in my head. I'm like, yo, we get this down to this before the five minute mark. That's shot. Ooh, you know what I'm saying? And they just coming, coming, coming. And, you know, seeing him do that dunk. Mm, um, the crossover. The, the, the crossover live. live. And seeing that, that, you know, explosion was crazy. Now, I missed the 81 game. Mm. I was out of, I was in Cabo with my wife, we was in Mexico. We watched it on TV, but I'm like, right. damn, the day we don't go, <laughs> we go for 81. And then I miss his farewell game because I'm filming Barbershop 3 or something in mm. Atlanta and, and I can't come to that last farewell game. So mm. I missed the 60 point mm. game, but um, I didn't miss nothing else. Mm. I didn't miss nothing else. That's big. So you co-narrated co the 30 for 30 Lakers Celtics thing. The Lakers obviously hung their 17th banner. Uh, talk to us about the experience of being able to do that for a team you grew up idolizing. Now you're narrating a story for them. Man, this whole life is surreal, you know. <laughs> for real. It's, um, we started, we was, you know, our favorite groups was in, you know, Run DMC and and all the East Coast groups, we thought those was the pros and we was trying to be that. And so to be able to create our own niche in music and become our own, you know, celebrities and then get a chance to share stages with Run DMC and get get a chance to get invited to all-star games mm -hmm. and meet your favorite, uh, you know, uh, athletes, entertainers, and then for somebody to come and tell you, look, we want you to narrate, you know, this precious rivalry mm. that you lived through. Mm. I mean, in 84, when the Lakers lost to the Celtics, I was this close to killing somebody. I was like, mm -hmm. I was this close to killing somebody because I had never experienced this whole Celtic Lake of rivalry. You know, my thing was like, I hate them 76ers because they beat us in, mm -hmm. and, you know, they beat us in 82, they beat us in 83. 
Don't worry about no Celtics. We yeah. got Magic. We got we got Kareem. We got mm-hmm. Worthy, you know. And so did we have Worthy? We didn't have Worthy, I don't think. But anyway, my brother, when we when, when he was like, yo, we playing the Celtics, he just got sad. He was like, oh, damn. I'm like, what? We can beat him. He was like, man, I lived through this. So I lived through the 60s. We couldn't beat these dudes. Mm. And and we lost. And I just, you know, I was crushed. So, you know, long story short, we finally beat him in 85 and mm-hmm. then beat him again in 87. You know, they got us when we were shorthanded, but we beat him again. But, you know, so I had real feelings, real passion for that mm-hmm. as a kid crying over these games and to be able to uh, – put that on wax, so to speak. Mm-hmm. It was just, uh, you know, it was just one of those dream come true moments. We all know what it feels like to miss the game winning shot, but trust me, you don't want to be in the guy in the bedroom missing your shots. If you've been having issues in the bedroom, not to worry. Just go to GetRoman.com slash ATS for a free online evaluation. Once evaluated, you'll be in touch with a licensed healthcare professional who can help you create a treatment plan and even prescribe the necessary medication. One of the best perks of using Roman, outside of not having to go to the doctor's office, is they ship their medication free via two-day shipping. Just go to GetRoman.com slash ATS now and complete an online visit and save up to $15 on your first month of treatment. Talk to us about your upbringing and how you find your path into music. I grew up like everybody else, you know, nothing, um, nothing special, you know what I'm saying, but nothing crazy. Um, you know, we had a, you know, a neighborhood that, you know, anything could jump off, you know what I'm saying? You just had to be ready for, for everything. You know, most of the time it was cool, though, but sometimes you had to, you know, it could get, you know, violent, it could get uh, crazy, mm-hmm. or, you know, or it would be cool, you know. So you just had to be ready for all that and, you know, find your pecking order. You know, it was a pecking order in the hood. You had to knuckle up and figure out where you, mm-hmm. where you fit at. And once you found out where you fit at, you was cool. You know, you knew, okay, this dude is in my range, this dude is out of my range. I got to get with this one. I might need to go grab my brother and we might need to mop him together. You know what I'm saying? So it was, you know, it was a, a that kind of neighborhood. You just had to be tougher enough. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, and music came because, you know, I wanted to be creative. You know what I mean? I wanted to be productive and not destructive. I wanted to either play sports uh, or do something else, you know what I'm saying? Um, banging, it didn't really turn me on, like mm-hmm. something I had to do, you know? I just was like, I'm gonna just be down for me. Anybody sweat me for, for about where I'm from, then, then you know, I'll go get the homies about that, but I'm gonna just be <laughs> down for me. Yeah. And so um, that's how I approached it. And it's got, it, it, uh, It led me where I was looking for different avenues. And then, you know, Sir James moves down the street from me. And his cousin is Dr. Dre. And so he's the only one on our street with turntables. This is Jinx, turntables with, you know, he bringing cardboard outside. He's spinning on his head and shit. And we like, we down the street looking like, what's up with this dude? (laughs) You know, we didn't know about breaking and all that shit, Mm. but he was, Graffiti, he just was a B-boy, you know, he was the, you know, the hip hop guru on the street. So I started to go down there and hang with him because I used to go out with his sister. So I just go hang with him. What age was this? Uh, 13, 14, 15. Mm-hmm. And uh, and people would trip. They'd be like, man, why are you going out to hang that weirdo, man? I'd be like, <laughs> man, 
I said, you be doing some dope shit in that room, mm-hmm. man. I start rhyming, and and me and him, you know, we just start working. He would put on beats. He would help me rhyme, rhyme on beat because I didn't have no beats. I was just a cappella, you know what I'm saying? So help me. Then I, then Dre came through one day and heard me rhyme, and Dre kind of took me under his wing um, because him and Jinx, I mean, Jinx would always want to compete with him. Mm-hmm. Jinx would I'm a better DJ than you, nigga. I'm better. I do be better beats. I do better everything. Dre would be like, come on, man. It's, you know, start me out with that. <laughs> but I would be, you know, more helpful. You know what I'm saying? I was like, what y'all working on as the wrecking crew? You know what I'm saying? Like, let me write something for y'all. Mm. You know what I'm saying? I was like trying to, mm-hmm. trying to get in. And I wrote something for them and it was a hit. Mm-hmm. We wrote it together, me and Dre. And it was a hit. And they 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 had a they had slow jam hits like turn mm-hmm. off the lights and yep. shit. But this was actually a hit that was moving. That they was playing all day on the radio, so he trusted me. Right. He started doing mixtapes. He would do traffic jams for the radio station. He started doing mixtapes for the hood, and he'd be like, "I want you to rap on it, but mm-hmm. don't worry about what you say. Just rap about the shit that's you know the raps that you rap about the shit that's going on around here. Do them raps." So I'm like, "All right, you know they got cussing in them." Like, it don't matter, it don't matter. Mm. Before we was thinking if you cuss, Can't do you it. won't get on the radio. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You it was like you don't do that unless you want it to be blowfly or do- dolomite or some shit. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So he was like, This ain't we ain't we ain't trying to sell these on the radio. So you can cuss on them if you want to. So I just start rapping about what was going on in the neighborhood, the shit I was seeing, and then those tapes were selling. It was selling fast. And then Easy came up on one of those tapes, tracked down the dude who got him made, and was like, "Who's who doing this?" I said, "That's Dre," and he like, "Dr. Dre, I know Dre." So he started coming around us, mm-hmm. and um, he wanted to be in the music business, he wanted to get out the dope game, and and Dre was like, uh, "You should have Q write something for one of your groups," because he was finding groups, he was finding these. Like rappers all over the city, you know, and like to find a rapper back then, that shit was like a hard. It wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. Everybody wasn't rapping, mm-hmm. and if they was, they wasn't good enough right. to put on a record. Mm-hmm. So, um, I wrote a rhyme for him, and they didn't like it. And then Trey got easy to do it. And, you know, it's all in the movie, Boys in the Hood. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm. That's how I got in. When did you kind of realize that? this NWA thing y'all was thinking about was becoming reality? Shit, when we went to the studio and started recording. You knew you, you had know. something immediately? Yeah, because we already had hit hits with Easy. We had hit singles with Easy. So when Easy said, like, I want a, I want an all-star group. Mm. See, NWA is considered an all-star group. Right. Because we all came from our own. I was in a group called CIA. Mm-hmm. Which was uh, criminals in action, but that was early. Like Alonzo made 14? us change it to crew in action, huh? That was like, what, like 14, 15. How were you in that? Um, I was about 17, 17, 17, 18. And uh, he said, "Man, let's do an all star group." You know, you got Easy E, pull Dre from uh, Wrecking Crew, we we'll pull you from CIA, and then we start working. And as we work, and more people start kind of coming around, then Arabian Prince. Started to hang, it was like, well, Arabian Prince was working really a lot with Uncle Jam's Army. So he was like, you part of the All-Stars too. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And then uh, Yella, the record crew had broke up. Dre wasn't really messing with Lonzo no more. So Yella came over with us. And um, and it was us. As soon as we did a record, I went off to school. Mm-hmm. I went to... Uh, school in, in Phoenix called PIT, Phoenix Institute of Technology. And I go off to school and then they had shows because we had a hit record. But I couldn't make it to all of them. So well, Ren well, started coming not, around. Not to cut you out, but what made you leave your passion and, and go to school? Did you think it wasn't going to pan out? Or Shit, was it? it was just a passion. Okay. You know, we was like, 
making tapes with all that cussing on them was one thing, but making a record with all that cussing on them, mm-hmm. we was like, man, ain't nobody going to. I ain't gonna play this shit. This, we not about to be big stars from this. So we be like, neighborhood go, stars. Go to we have a couple of people knowing our records through the neighborhood, probably. But this shit is too hard. Who gonna mm. play this? Mm. You know what I'm saying? So we just back then, you just figured it was too hard for anybody to play, but people in the neighborhood. So, but we was fine with that. We was like, if we if we just stars in Compton, Watts, South Central. Inglewood, blah, blah, blah. Shit, we got yeah. a better life than we had before we mm. were stars in Compton, Inglewood, mm. you know. Mm-hmm. So I was like, man, I need to have something to fall back on because I ain't about to be a professional rapper. Mm. Not rapping this shit right here. Imagine that. So Crazy, right? I went off to school and um, it started blowing up while I was in school. Mm. You got your degree you. too, right? Well, I got a certificate. It was only four years. It's a trade school, okay. y'all. It ain't a university. So, yeah, I got it. I stayed. I wasn't gonna. I wasn't gonna leave, even though I wanted to. Every damn day, mm-hmm. I, I, I was like, man, I started this shit. I'm gonna finish, finish it. it. It's only a year. Mm-hmm. And uh, but man, they would call me from the road. Nigga, are you crazy? What are you doing? I said, man, I'm doing the homework. <laughs> 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 Bye. Man, hang up. I be sitting there saying, damn. I was so frustrated one day, I tore up. Fuck the police. I tore it up, threw it in the trash. Cause I figured we wasn't gonna do it. And my homie, Phoenix Field, shout out to Phoenix Field. He was like, no, nope. I didn't tear it up, I bought it up. He pulled it out and he flattened it back out and put it in my notebook. I was like, no, that's too good. Mm. Yeah. How instrumental was Easy in all of this? Very instrumental. You know what I'm saying? He was you know, putting up all the money for the project. And he was saying what kind of records we need to make. Um, Lonzo wouldn't let us make those kind of records. You know, he was like, man, this thing was like, nobody want to hear about a nigga going to jail. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That was his biggest thing. And I'm like, you know, is he right? I don't know. Who knows? I'm I'm young. I'm 17 years Mm -hmm. old. And, um, Easy was like, man, these are the kind of records I like. Mm-hmm. So I'm going to put my money behind them. Mm-hmm. And these are the kind of records I'm going to do. And that's just it. So once he kind of let us do our thing, like we was harnessed a little bit. Well, I wasn't in the wrecking crew, but I did a record for Lonzo mm-hmm. and uh, the wrecking crew. And Lonzo was a good dude, you know what I mean? He, he could have kicked us. You know, we was getting on his nerves and shit. He could have kicked us out. I mean, leave my artists alone. Like, y'all kids get away from here. But he was cool. And um, and then Easy came around and just kind of let us do what we the, the hardcore hip hop that we really wanted to do. Mm-hmm. So so he was a genius. Mm-hmm. And, that- and uh, you know, he was just a genius at knowing what people wanted. Take us through the creation of Straight Outta Compton. You know, it was a fun record to make. Um, you know, you had Trey's undivided attention, you know, to have him um, very hype and motivated is, you know, one of the best places an artist can find himself Ooh. in, is in the, in the room with Dre and he's hyped and motivated about, you know, making this song what it's supposed to be. It's going to be work. It ain't going to be just go in there and rap your lyrics that come out. Mm-hmm. He gonna get every phrase and every line perfect. And so I knew like, you know, if I just went to the went to the studio with a with some ideas that, you know, he may pick a few of them, implement them into the song, and to see that process too uh is incredible. Uh so, you know, I I, I think it was a lot of friendly competition. Cause we was all trying mm-hmm. to out rhyme each other. Uh, DLC doesn't get a lot of credit for writing a lot of those those uh, verses. The, doc. the DLC, the Doc, he wrote a lot of that uh, of Easy's verses on not only his album but but on on NWA too. So um, we was just all trying to outdo each other, 
out rhyme each other, you know, and because Dre will tell you straight up, like, if you ain't dope, you're not going on the record. Mm. And if you listen to the record, <laughs> it's some records that some people own, some records that some mm. people ain't. And mm. he didn't come with it that day. So, mm. you know, he give you a chance to go back and try to make it right. And he'll take your ass off of that record. And that's <laughs> the worst feeling in the world. Mm. Yeah. yeah. I mean, what's it like working with, with Dre? I mean, you said, like you said he kind of took you under his arm and, and kind of taught you part of the game but what is it like what, what kind of mad scientist is he back there because I've seen someone like Kobe work and, and what his brain and how crazy he is with perfection and being great is it similar with Dre yeah you know at some points it's frustrating because you like this shit is bananas and it's not for him yet you know what I mean it's like mm, not quite <laughs> and you like what and you don't understand. He's like, what's wrong with my ears, man? You know, you going in the bathroom, you shaking your ears out. You're like, what I don't hear? Mm. This shit is crazy. And man, he'll shelf that song. You'll never hear it again. Mm. And you'll be like, man, what about the song we did 04, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, that you still holding on to? That shit are hitting now. You're like, nah, man, we got to do something new. So, you know, that could be frustrating, mm -hmm. but when you let them go, they usually write, you know? So it's just, I mean, how is it in the kitchen with your mama when she cooking Thanksgiving dinner? You know what I'm saying? You step back and try not to get in the fucking way. You know what I'm yeah. saying? Yeah. And like, when do we eat? That's your best you know what I mean? That's how it's like, you mm. know, when you just going, smelling around, you seeing, you know, all the musicians there and you know, it's going to be hot. You just got to, Worry about your rhymes and your delivery. So luckily the homie from from uh, Phoenix saved Fuck the Police. Was there any hesitation? Because at that time, like a song like that is just absolutely unheard of. Was there hesitation by anyone in the group once you presented? Was everyone really just like, let's get this shit? Yeah, it was hesitation. Dre, he didn't want to do the song because he had an ankle bracelet on and he was doing weekends at the county. They was making him. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he was like, punished. I was like, man, fuck. He said, man, I ain't, I ain't. He said, I got to deal with these fucking sheriffs, man, every weekend. And, and I ain't going in there with a song like this, man. So no. <laughs> so I, I didn't think it was going to get made mm -hmm. until, you know, months later when we was, you know, doing the record. Cause we had did some solo records, you know, before we did dope man. We did Gangsta Gangsta. So we was gonna do another mm -hmm. solo record, which was Fuck the Police. And he was like, not that one. So um, after all that blew over, after he, you know, kind of, you know, had that case dismissed or whatever, he was down to do it because mm -hmm. he didn't have to see him every weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I was, I wrote the song because I was mad he would have to go in on the weekends because he was our, way into every party in the city. You know, I'm like, we were Drake, nigga. What's up? We go in, you know what I mean? <laughs> Without him, it was like, uh, hey, 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 who, who, <laughs> who y'all with? We, would, we was with Dre last week. He's like, it ain't, it ain't last week, homie. <laughs> Don't get to the back of the line. So our partying was on E, you know what I'm saying? We was house partying. I'm like, man, this house party shit is dangerous. You know what I'm saying? We need to go back to some clubs, like skating rinks and shit like that, you know? And Dre so, was to get in free cards. Straight up. You show with Dre, you getting in free. <laughs> straight out of cop to reach platinum level. How big was that? It was incredible, you know? Just being able to, you know, go across the country, see that, see that record, like, move in a wave of underground greatness, you know, wasn't being blasted on every station, but it was moving like it was. Mm -hmm. And so we was proud. And we was proud that uh, the groups we had looked up to now was um, engaging with us on a whole nother level. You know, before it was like, you know, what's up? Mm -hmm. Now it was like, Hey, yo, that record mm -hmm, y'all got mm -hmm. is crazy, you right. know? So mm -hmm. it was that kind of interaction with, you know, the LLs of the world, the Slick Ricks, mm -hmm. uh, Chuck D, Flav. Chuck D was always cool. When we was just opening up, Chuck D was cool with us. Mm -hmm. But, you know, 
back then, you know, MCs be like, yeah, that's your crew, this is our crew. And the mingling was, you only mingle with who you knew. And so it was cool to to start getting some of the respect and um, from the groups that we respected. Mm -hmm. So that's what was amazing about it. Because you could be in the game, you know, y'all both uh, NBA players and money is cool. Rings are all right. That respect yeah, yeah. means everything. It's everything. It means more than all that other shit mm -hmm. combined. That people don't look at you and be like, "Man, look at that suck ass nigga." Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. People look and be like, "Salute for the way you were, the way you played, um, and and who you are." You know, that's more important than anything. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't don't realize that. You know, you lose that respect, and it's hard to get it back. They lose it. Can can you imagine the movement you guys had, how you have captivated everyone if there was social media back then? Yeah, I mean, I think it would have been maybe too fast to sustain itself, you know what I'm saying? It's like, I like this the organic way. The slow burn. I like having, you know, the underground find out about us and then mm -hmm. the mainstream is nervous, scared. Few of them have enough courage to bump it, you know what I mean? And, yeah. and I just like that energy that, you know, it organically grew as a movement um, and not an overnight quick pop, uh -huh. you know what I'm saying? Because can burn fast. I mean, NWA already burnt hot. You know, it burnt mm -hmm. hot. You know what yeah. I mean? It's about it's about three years of uh, you know what I'm saying, and it's over. Maybe mm -hmm. two years of yeah. red hot NWA. You know what I mean? Eighty seven, eighty nine, and it's over. It's crazy to think that, but the impact you had in that small amount of time was, I mean, really changed changed the game completely. Yeah. I mean, it's the family tree. It's the branches. It's right. the roots and the branches and the. You know, Dre is the trunk, and we are the branches off that. So, you know, that's what, that's the movement. You know, mm -hmm. it's, it's all, it's the whole West Coast movement. It intertwines together in a way. As athletes, you know, Jack and I never really kind of got to appreciate what we've been through and the experiences we had until we were done. I mean, you're not done, but you're not in it as heavy as you were in the past. Do you ever just sit back and think like, damn, like, we did this? Yep. You know, but I, I did that every step of the way. You, see, I that's you know what I'm saying? Because I didn't want to, you know, I want to be present. You know what I'm saying? I don't mm -hmm. want to be uh, taking anything for granted. Right. You know what I'm saying? So I always, you know, just kind of reflect and give thanks and praise for all the blessings. Right. And, um, and recognize them you know, in real time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Your relationship with Easy, your reconciliation before his passing, uh, talk to us about that and how important it was to uh, reconcile with him before his untimely passing. Man, it was very, you know, I feel very, um, you know, satisfied because I was able to do that. Um, I think I would be, you know, real restless you know, about it a little more if if he didn't know what he really meant to me, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, outside mm -hmm. the bullshit. And I was able to express that. And we was able to truly get past it. You know, sometimes you could say, you know, we squashed this shit, right? And it's like, yeah, yeah, all right. Yeah, we squashed, all right. You know, but you ain't about to mess with dude ever yeah. again. You know what yeah. I'm saying? But But sometimes you can squash it and it really be squashed. Mm -hmm. And you just continue like it never even happened almost. And I knew that I was going to reach out to him. I was going to work with him if he wanted to. If, if he could put NWA back together mm. and get Dre back on, I was going to work mm -hmm. with him. So, you know, I just knew that, you know, um, we really squashed our beef that day. So it was great. Your departure for MWA, obviously it was portrayed in the film and you can read about it and we know about it. But for those who don't, what was your main reason behind leaving MWA? 
I just felt like we wasn't uh, the top priority of the management. I felt like it was a conflict of interest in a lot of ways that um, you know, Jerry Heller was so close to um, owning and running Ruthless with Easy that him being our manager, that he would look out for easy and not really in WA. So that was one conflict and he just proved me right on how he was dealing with my business in particular. Mm -hmm. And um, and he straight up lied on my mom's, you know what I'm saying? He like, he, he lied on her for no reason. There's no reason to lie on her. And so as a youngster, all them other things you can kind of get with, but 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 one thing is the straw that breaks the camel's back. Yep. And that was it. And I'm like, a man that a lie mm. to a dude about his own mama is not a man to be trusted. I didn't trust him. I didn't sign the contracts when they was presented. And they they ostracized me. And and what was crazy is like when once I left the group, they uh they started to pay me. Like once I had a solo deal, mm -hmm. they started to pay me and I didn't understand. And I went to my manager, Pat Charbonnet, and I'm like, why, why they, uh, paying me now? Yeah, why they paying me now? It's like they cause all this shit. We got fuse in the street. We got mm. records against, against each other and all kind of shit. Like why they paying me now? <clears throat> he said, because <clears throat> you were right. And, um, they don't want you to sue them. And I said, well, why didn't they just pay me when I was in the group? He said, well, they would have had to pay everybody else. Mm. So they'd rather mm. get you out the way and not have to pay for p other people. You know what I'm saying? So it's bullshit. Dirty gay. Yeah, it's dirty. America's mm. Most Wanted. The album cover you say is you, the one you're most proud of. Why is that? That one's dope because... It, you know, it was a new technique, you know, overland, if you really look at that artwork. Mm -hmm. And so I was just proud of what it stood for, the symbolism in it. Like, uh, all of Los Angeles is behind me. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And, and or, all of the countries behind me. It depends on which way I'm right. standing, you know. Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm facing if I'm facing the West, I got the whole country behind yeah. me. Yeah. So I like that. Um because, you know, that's how we gotta move to 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 get some kind of justice around here mm -hmm. yeah, as a unit. What goes through the process when you're creating album covers? Trying to have something that stand the test of time. Mm -hmm. Trying to have something that when you see it it explains what's in it. Like when you see the album, that the album represents the flavor of the record that that's coming. in there. You know, I think it's all art and it has to be treated like art or it's not, you know what I mean? Either it's art, either it's entertainment and music, or it's not. It's mm -hmm. street, you know, regular old amateur shit. You know? <laughs> You make your acting debut uh, in Boys in the Hood, something that I read that you didn't really want to do. You didn't want to act. How mm -hmm. important or how thankful for you that you actually did and how impactful do you feel that classic of Boys in the Hood is? You know, I didn't want to act because I didn't think I was qualified. I thought you had to go to Juilliard or some kind of mm -hmm. school on, f like, like the shit on fame. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. Had to like go to one of them schools to actually be an actor, or you was just bullshitting. So I was like, "Why you want me?" You know what I mean? I'm like, "There's a lot of actors around here." And it's John Singleton too. They want you. Well, John Singleton, he was just an intern at at uh, the Arsenio Hall show. You know, it's, yeah, that's how it started. Man, I'm I'm back there. I'm near to see Arsenio because I want to give him a piece of my mind because. <laughs> 
he had the two live crew on the show and he wouldn't have NWA on. And I'm like, mm-hmm. man, the two live crew, that's some dirty shit. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, how, why you can't have us on? But I never got a chance to talk to him about it. Instead, I spent all my time talking to this little intern, Sean Singleton, who's mm-hmm. telling me that I'm perfect for his movie. You know, and I'm like, your movie? He's like, yeah, man, I'm a junior. I'm a junior at USC. And I got a movie that's perfect for you. Mm. Like, all right, man. That's crazy. All right, man. I end up seeing him a year later. He runs up to me. He says, remember me? And I'm like, nope. He said, <laughs> I seen a hall show. Remember the movie I told you that you was right for? I'm like, yeah. He said, man, I'm a senior now at USC. And, uh. I'm gonna put you in this movie. It's all right, man. All right, all right, dude. You know, whatever. I leave NWA, go solo. Public Enemy got a show at the Palace out here in Hollywood. I go. Dude tapped me on the shoulder. It's John Singleton. <laughs> On your ass, huh? Remember me? <laughs> I said, I remember your ass now. <laughs> What's up, man? You got a movie for me. I know, I know. What is it? What is it? I said, yeah, no, I just want to tell you about it. I said, all right, all right. So after the show, we in the parking lot, and he telling me the movie, like, damn near. I'm like, what, what, what? You know, I'm ready to leave. And his ride leaves him. So he has to ask me for a ride to his dorm. <laughs> to his dorm. So I'm like, Asking damn, high school, homie. That's crazy. Damn. So, but, you know, I'm like, right. I don't want to... I want this dude to get hurt out here. I said, all right, I, I, I said, I'll drive you. I don't hear nothing from him. You know, I drop him off that day. We didn't even exchange numbers. It was just like, all right, man. And because I never really believed him. And then my manager months later said, um, somebody want to put you in a movie. You know, she was even surprised. She was like, somebody want to put you in a movie. Who? What? Huh? I had forgot all about this dude. You know, months go by. I'm trying to be the best rapper in the world. I ain't thinking about acting at all. He sends the script. It's like, yo, you gotta, you gotta audition. I throw the script in the back seat of my car. I fold the sides, which are the shit I gotta practice, put that in my pocket, and never look at it. And I go to the audition, and when I get to the audition, it's him sitting there. He's like, remember me? I'm like, <laughs> yeah. This your movie? He said, yeah, I told you I was going to do it. You didn't believe me. I said, man, I did not believe you. <laughs> yeah. And he said, all right, let's, I want you to be dope with this shit. He said, you, you ready? And I'm like, oh, let me find these sides out of my pocket. Reading them. I'm like, I'm reading. I'm whack. I'm whack. The audition is garbage. And he looks at me. He's like, man, did you read my script? I was like, no. Nope. <laughs> he said, did you read the sides? I'm like, no. Nope. <laughs> He's like, Q, man, come on, man. He said, look, I'll give you one more shot, dude. Go home, read the whole script, start to finish tonight, and then come back tomorrow. And once I read it, I'm looking at my wife, Kim, I'm like, damn, they doing a, they doing a movie about our neighborhood. Mm. Read this shit. This is about how we grew up. So I'm tripping that. I'm like, damn, this is movie worthy. I'm looking at it. It's like, yeah, I guess so. They doing a movie on it. Mm. I guess it's movie worthy. Damn, niggas care about how we grew up. All right. So I go in the next day and I kill it. I'm ready, you know, and he give me the part and he kind of coached me through the movie between him, uh, Lawrence Fishburne, mm. you know, and uh, Cuba Gooden Jr. You know, they, they, they held me down on that movie and helped me get through it. That's dope. Yeah. Question. We asked Dion this too. Was your curl wet or dry back then? Come on now. You know, I had a dry curl <laughs> with a wet look. You Come on, baby. Dion Dion the Santa same same shit. It looked wet, but, but it, it was dry. dry. Yeah, man. You had to get the right, you know, kind. You know what I'm saying? You had to get the right, you know. It you looked get the right. wet. Yeah, but yeah. But it was dry. It was dry. You know what I'm saying? So 
Yeah, I didn't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't. You know, I used to see dudes dripping. I'd be like, homie, <laughs> too much. You giving us a bad name. <laughs> 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 yeah, that's because I met my dad in the early '80s. His shit dripped, like in the yeah, early, I, I early '80s. Yeah, I wasn't going for that. Drip. That's I why he's going for it. I wasn't going to be wiping chemical. my neck off all day. Like we're going to get this shit under control. I'm gonna cut it. Yeah, your pop used to carry a towel. He had a white towel around his shit. Yeah, that shit was. Why you just pat that shit down a little bit, man? You ain't gotta have it dripping. That's why he ain't got no hair now. Oh, chemicals. Yeah, yeah, them chemicals. That shit would burn. It's a trip stand out, some standout moments from the set uh, with, from John Singleton. You remember? The part, you know, outside where the dude pull the gun, shoot the AK, yeah. and we yeah. all pull off. Yeah. All that's real. Not, 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 of course, it's a film, him shooting a gun, but they did not let nobody know it was going to be real gunshots. You know, they you said- You almost hit somebody. Who told You almost ran over to some dude leg at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. I thought it was real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I thought it was, you know, it's it's a lot of people out there. You know what I mean? It's 60s right. out there. It's, mm. it's everybody out there watching us film. Mm -hmm. And it's the people in the movie. Mm -hmm. And then John kept saying on the bullhorn, when I say bang, 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 everybody run like it's a, you know, we like, all right. It's like, yeah, I'm gonna okay, when I say bang, bang, all right, say bang, 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 so we can do this. But when it was time to shoot, they pulled out a real AK and let it off. <laughs> it's all another Why, story. Just see how everybody react. <laughs> That's real. Everybody, I'm trying, I, I was trying to get out of there. I thought, movie over. Yeah. <laughs> this shit is turned out. I'm saying, but, but how, 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 could they, how could they act that good with Cube almost take this no, mother's leg off. That's real. <laughs> right. I'm trying to get out of there. I'm thinking, this movie over. Somebody yeah. dead. Somebody <laughs> killing. I mean, it's AK for real. And so he got us on that one, man. You yeah. know, you know, dope. resetting that scene, boy. It was hard to get people to come back. <laughs> <laughs> Go still, running. Running. still running. It's like yeah. they call you, come back, man. We did that on purpose. What? What? We did on the no. Wait, I'm I'm going to my trailer. No, come back. Because that know? was in the real time. That could really happen on set. Yeah, yeah. We nobody shot movies around there. You know what I mean? It was mm. like it was so many. It was it was that element already out there watching us. Yeah, shoot this big ass Crenshaw scene. Like taking over the street they love. So we didn't know what was gonna happen. Mm -hmm. We was worried about that the whole time. We got threatened, you know what I mean? When we we when when they heard that we we heard Ice Cube supposed to kill some bloods in the movie, mm -hmm. that it was a problem. They wanted to, you know, sweat John Singleton <laughs> like, why are he killing bloods in the movie? This, that, and the other. He's like, man, this is a movie. movie yeah, tell the story. That shit. So, um, yeah, it was some issues because we did it right there in the jungle, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying, and right where they be, and they, they wasn't happy. They wasn't happy about it. Mm. But, you know, somebody got paid, I guess. They let it happen. Mm -hmm. Classic. I mean, this is your first film, but you get the chance to work with a, a Lawrence Fishburne, obviously a John Singleton in Cuba. What was that like for you, kind of your introduction into this new space? I was big fans. You know, I was a big fan of... Lawrence Fishburne, you know, from uh, uh, Cornbread, Earl and Me and shit. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah. saying? I love that movie. And I was like, damn, you the little boy in Corn Cornbread, Earl and Me? He was like, yep. Then I loved him in Apocalypse Now. You know what I'm saying? I didn't know Cuba Gooden Jr. and, you know, Angela Bassett and all Neil these Long. people. Neil Long. I didn't, I didn't know them, but they was dope actors. And mm -hmm. I was like, they in the movie, so they must be, they must be official. Mm -hmm. And, um... You know, we got we did a lot of rehearsals like improv, where you know I really was able to get my feet up under me, get my balance on what it takes to to do good acting and what it takes to be bad. You know, I may have done some bad acting in movies, but you know, it was just showing me the way. Mm -hmm. You know, nineteen ninety five. How did Friday Friday present itself? What kind of experience was was that? I wrote that with the homie DJ Pooh. DJ Pooh. Pooh. Yeah, DJ Pooh. Shout out. We had been big fans of Hollywood Shuffle. You know, shout out to Robert Townsend. Robert Townsend, he's a genius. You know, without Robert Townsend, 
There is no Friday mm-hmm. because he, you know, shot that movie with a damn credit card down there. You know, he showed us like, don't wait on Hollywood, man. Gorilla that shit if you have to mm-hmm. and tell your story. So, and um, he had some great comedians. You know, I I, I stole John Witherspoon from mm. from um, from uh, Robert Townsend. And so we was fans of that. We was fans of In Living Color. Mm-hmm. You know, um, and we had saw so many movies about how we grew up, from Boys in the Hood to to Menace to Society to South Central, even Colors. We was like, damn, man, niggas think it's Vietnam around here. It's like, is it that bad? I mean, we didn't we have fun around here mm-hmm. a little bit? Didn't we laugh? Like, yeah, it's like, man, let's write a movie about how we looked at all this shit instead of how, you know, we don't want nobody to feel sad for how we grew up, you know what I'm saying? Or be like, damn, you know, y'all, surprise y'all ain't in prison. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So um, we just wanted to have fun and, you know, have two dudes on the porch just tripping off how crazy their neighborhood is. And um, and that's how the ball started to roll on, you know, what Friday was going to be about. How'd you find Chris Tucker? I saw him on Def Comedy Jam. You know, shout out to Russell Simmons. Mm-hmm. Saw him on Def Comedy Jam. And I was like, this kid is funny as hell. And then he did a small little part in House Party 3. And I was like, <clears throat> kid and play fucked up because they did not use this kid enough mm-hmm. in this movie. So I was like, if I get a movie, I'm, I got to find something for this dude. And I felt the same way about Bernie Mac too. Mm. Um, and so Friday came up and we were gonna raise the money and do it ourselves. But then New Line came in and said, you know, we wanna give y'all the money, co own it with y'all. And so we was like, cool, you know, because it was struggle, it was a struggle to get the amount of money we needed to shoot it right. So we was happy to have, you know, shout out to Bob Shea. You know, uh, when uh, New Line knew what they was doing. But mm-hmm. but uh, shout out to Bob Shea. And so they uh, come on and they say, I say, I don't want y'all to do the movie because y'all going to mess it up. Y'all don't know what, y'all don't know what this is. This is some hood shit that I don't see y'all mess up too many movies. Mm. They was like, we won't touch it. We won't touch it. Just bring us the finished movie, basically. Mm. He's like, okay, give us the money. So... They said one thing though. Um, I had I had DJ Pooh playing Smokey, mm-hmm. me and him. And they was like, "You've been in movies, Q, but Pooh hasn't. So we need somebody to be Smokey. We can give Pooh another part, but Smokey is in most of the movie. We need us. A... Mm-hmm. How about Tommy Davidson? I'm like, I like Tommy, but." We gotta have somebody kind of unknown. Like you gotta believe he ain't nobody but Smokey. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm already Ice Cube doing a comedy. Mm-hmm. You gotta believe I'm Craig. So we need somebody you don't know. So I was like, I know this kid, Chris Tucker. And everybody was like, Who? No, no. Boom, boom, boom. I was like, Y'all just put him in a fucking movie. Y'all saying no? Y'all put him in House Party Three. I said, Man, get a dude to audition. Fly him out here. Let's give him an audition. And once we got on that, like, we auditioned together, it was a rap. It was over. over. I'm like, told you, told you, told you, told you, told you. <laughs> but transitioning, obviously, you were able to make more Fridays, losing him, but then picking up Mike Epps. Yeah. What was that like? Mike Epps is my favorite person to work with. Mm, I love Mike. Because Mike is, what you see is what you get. Mm-hmm. It, it's no act. It's not like. <laughs> That's really him. Yeah. It's not like he got a be day day. You right. know what I mean? It's like, damn, it's a real walking living day day. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So, you know, I wanted somebody to have, you know, you can't replace Chris Tucker. Mm-hmm. But I wanted somebody who was, you know, crazy and fun and and in his own right, funny. And so we was lucky to get Mike and to have him buy into the series and you know, I've done several movies with Mike. Mm-hmm. You know, we did all about the Benjamins. That's one of my favorite. You yeah. know, janky promoters. Yeah, hell yeah. Uh, so, 
you know, I, I hope to work with him my whole career. I hope we just yeah. do movies like like a Cheech and Chong. Like Y'all forever. got a nice dynamic. Poetic Justice, I heard a story that they came to you first to play Janet's love interest and it just wasn't your thing. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. John had wrote it for me, you know, and he was like, <laughs> It would have been my Remember thing Gideon? all of a sudden. <laughs> <laughs> I just had one part in there that I just couldn't get down with. And I was like, John, dude, you got to change this part. And he was like, I'm not changing one word. Mm. I just got a damn Oscar nomination for my last script. <laughs> right? like, God damn, John. And it was the part, I'm like, dude, I can't play a dude who kick his homie out the car over a chick he just met. Even yeah. if it's Janet goddamn yeah, Jackson, yeah, he I did can't do that. Do that. Yeah, that's crazy. Do that that part, that. I'm not cool with that. Yeah, I said, that that ain't a part I want to play, so. That's crazy. I did that. Pac picked it up and, and ran with it. Yeah, you know, and um, I think it was better for him, you know what I'm saying? He, he did a great job, you know, and he, you know, Pac is a movie star anyway, so you know, he he uh I went to go see it. I, I like the movie. Mm-hmm. You know, I like mm-hmm. it. yeah, yeah. Is it true you keep the head from the anaconda at your crib? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I got the head. Oh yeah. shit. <laughs> yeah, I got the head on my show. <laughs> yeah, I got the head, you know. It's it been there for a long time. Probably dust that bitch off. But yeah, he be sitting there looking at me. <laughs> How was the transition and how important was it for you to go from part of gangster rap creation to making kid movies? That crossover has been legendary, and I don't think anyone's had such a drastic crossover, period, than you. You know, I always was like, you know, you can't and you shouldn't judge a book by its cover. You know, you really, if you do, you you probably... uh... Racist. (laughs) You probably misjudging, and you're probably on your heels if you do. When I did Boys in the Hood, you know, people thought, why would you do a comedy? Why would you do a movie like Friday? You know, you, you got this lane. You know, I was offered Old Dog too in Menace. Really? Yeah, and I was like, man, I'm I'm like, I just played Doughboy. Mm-hmm. I just played Savon in Trespass. Trespass, yeah, Trespass I'm not yeah. going to play another be hood. another killer, dude. huh? Oh, killer, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, so I'm like, nah, man, you know, I don't want it. But... You know, I'm always like, let's push the envelope, man. You know, don't box me in mm-hmm. with nothing. Don't, don't, don't even think about it. If you think you know what I'm gonna do, you know what I mean, you wrong. So doing Friday, you know, showed okay, I could do comedy, you know, and I'm not just stuck with these dramas about the hood. And then we did Barbershop. Barbershop was a PG-13 movie, and it was Tim Story's first movie, and it blew up, you know? It was a, it was a movie that mm-hmm. showed that we don't all think the same, you know what I'm saying? Even though if we come from the same neighborhood, that don't mean we think the same. Right. So I was like, well, if I could do a PG-13, can I do a PG? Can I, can I do it for the kids? Because it's crazy when you got five and six-year-olds saying, I love Friday. Right. I'm like, what your little ass doing watching Friday? <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So I'm like, huh. My fans got kids now. Mm-hmm. Let me um do something for them. Mm-hmm. Because the worst thing in the world, too, as an artist, is if your fans have to tell their kids who you was. Like, that dude Ice Cube, he used to be the shit. So you don't want that. You want the kids to know who you are. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? So... Doing that movie, kids know who I am. You know, kids mm-hmm. love me. You know what I'm saying? Because they love Nick. They love, you know, the, the, the character on Are We There Yet? So it was the attempt to grab the next generation love it. with quality. Mm-hmm. You know, they just don't make movies like that for our kids. So right. to do something I knew, this movie's going to stand the test of time for the youngsters like Friday is for the adults. So it gave every age group something to to be down with. Some of Ice Cube. Yeah. How did Straight Outta Compton come about? I didn't think about making that movie, but I heard they was going to make it. Here we go with New Line again. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so these dudes was going to make the movie, Jerry Heller's version of it, from mm. his book. You kidding me? I said, man, 
y'all want me to really pull that bat out again? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> y'all really, y'all really want me to hurt somebody up here? Why would y'all do that, man? Y'all got to do this movie with us. Right, we got right. me, Dre. We got mm-hmm. you know, and um, um, Tamika who had the rights mm-hmm. to the music Easy. and yeah. the story. It's like I do the movie with the people that was there. Jerry don't know shit. Mm-hmm. He wasn't there. He came after the sauce was made. You know what I mean? He came mm-hmm. after the dinner was laid. Mm-hmm. So they're like, yeah, 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 you're right. So they they pushed <laughs> him off to the side, start working on my script. We got it all the way there. And then they didn't want to spend the money to do the movie. Like, they wanted to spend like $17, 18000000 million to do Straight Outta Compton, which is a $34 million movie. Mm-hmm. So... Picture that movie done at seventeen million. It's not looking as good. Mm, it's not the quality. The quality is not there. It's not as epic. We ended up, you know, thank God for Donna Langley. We ended up getting her to buy the movie and take it over to Universal, and she did it right. And it's you know huge hit. History. Mm-hmm. What was it like watching your son play you? Cause you just said some shit, and I'm going back to the movie. And you, you sound, you and your son sound the exact like, same when you're yeah. talking about Jerry. That energy came back, but I felt your son on that shit too. It's amazing for him to be able to get the part because a lot of people think it's a shoe in I could have just gave him the part, but movies, it's a process, especially the big ones. If it's thirty four million dollars up, somebody gonna have something to say. Mm-hmm. So. You know, he had to audition. He had to go through the process. He had to get approved from the studio. So I put him through the ringer. You know, I I actually thought that we doing so much to this kid, he going to quit before we even get to the set. And if he do that, then then nobody got to know about it. You know what I'm saying? He got bit by the bug. Mm -hmm. Because I was, was, you know, sending him to trainers to study in L.A. and New York. And I was thinking he was going to say, I don't want to go, man. Why am I doing this? You know what I'm saying? But he was like, oh, I'm with it, man. I got to meet my my acting coach. And, you know, he was mm-hmm. just getting hyped about it. But I still hadn't told Gary Gray, like, because he was the first person I needed to tell. So I, I pulled Gary aside and said, hey, man. I said, I got to tell you something. He was like, what? I said, I want my son to play me. Gary was like, man, what the f- Fuck. <laughs> Q, I thought we was making a real movie here, man. I said, this is a real movie. This is a real movie, Gary. Mm-hmm. You going to do to me what John Singleton did. You going to do it for my son what John Singleton did for me. Yeah. You going to walk him through this. Mm-hmm. And he going to be great. Mm. And you ain't going to find nobody better. Right. He knows and you. so he was like, all right, let me see. And then as the auditions and all the stuff start coming around and screen tests and camera tests, he was like, yeah, he, mm. he housed that shit. Ain't mm-hmm. nobody. Straight <laughs> up. Can't nobody do it. Straight my up. My son said when he went to the audition <laughs> and there was other ice cubes there. He was mad. He's like, man, what the fuck are you? He's like, I got to do this for the family. He's like, yeah, my huh? family legacy <laughs> on the line. Let you bozos be, play my pops. Now he doing his own shit. They yeah, now he, he in Star Wars. You know, he got yeah. this Obi-Wan Kenobi movie. He did uh, Godzilla. I mean, he mm-hmm. doing big-ass movies. And he was a fan of all these things. So to be able to be a, be a part of it To now, be a yeah. part of him, he living his best life, for that's real. What, um, it's a movie he done recently. And oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That's... Uh, Den of Thieves. Yeah, yeah, that's his movie. Yeah, Den of Thieves. Yeah, I got to give him his props. Yeah. That, was, that yeah. was the one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Den of Thieves. Yeah, he was the man in that. Yeah. I mean, he flipped it on him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I was looking at them. I'm like, man, what kind of And guy? set it up for a part two. Yeah, the yeah, he set off. it up. Yeah, yeah. so he going he gonna to do part two. They mm-hmm. came out with, with the part shit. two. Den of Thieves, yeah. That's dope. Yeah, he a good actor, man. You know, he, he ain't just... You know, he ain't just bullshitting. He, he got the chops. Speaking of your son, you know, you got another son. What's the best part of being a father? Being able to teach them the game and the pitfalls that's out there for them. Being able to put them up on as much of this, um, you know, the intricate workings of this world, putting them up on that game as much as possible. Uh, Being there, you know what I'm saying? Just being there Mm -hmm. as, as... 
being present. You know, some men are home, but are you present? Right. right. Mm-hmm. Just being home, being in the in the back room and shit on that game ain't present. Mm-hmm. Give them stability. Um, making sure they not, you know, some of those same old statistics um, because of my actions. You know what I'm right. saying? Mm-hmm. Like, so it's just been great to see them become, you know, respectable grown men. They just good people, mm-hmm. and to me, that's the biggest accomplishment is that they good people. Mm. What's the biggest piece of advice you've given them you feel? Man, it's hard to say that because I give them so much so much advice mm-hmm. every day. You know, just telling them about who they are and what they up against is, is some of my best moments. You know what I'm saying? Because you know, my pops they're from a different era. You know what I'm saying? And their era is, you know, uh, my own business, work, you know what I'm saying? Take care of your family. Take care of your family and stop all that fucking complaining. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> That's their philosophy. You got to remember here. And, and, yeah, and my philosophy is similar to that, but it's like, nah, you know what I mean? I want to I wanna fight the powers that be. Right. Mm. Yeah. Talk to them. Yeah. Goddamn right. How did the concept of the big three come about? I mean, to, to, to think what you did, and obviously, you know, Jack being right there in the mix, once you got going, I was just like, when I heard about it, I was like, this is going to be crazy if it ever happens, and you made it happen. Talk to us about that process. I mean, made it happen with some great people. I mean, Stax was the heart and soul. All-time leading scorer. Of, of My the, boy. Yeah. yeah. All-time leading scorer in the <laughs> league uh, when he hung it up. And so, you know, he, he going to be our coach now, yes. trilogy. Yep. But he set the tone. Thank you. Just being a fan, seeing, seeing y'all retire and knowing, damn, I know they got more game. Mm. I know it. Like, I'm not listening to what people are saying. I'm not listening to announcers and people who... All they want to talk about is age. All they want to talk about is how old somebody is. And they're not talking about can you do it or you can't. Because you got young people that can't play. Right, Mm -hmm. right. You got 21-year-olds that 23, 25, 27. They can't play. Trash. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So it's either you can do it or you can't. So seeing dudes retire after building up, Fan base from high school, junior high, college, pros. Like, these dudes got fucking 20 years of fans. And they just, poof, gone. Mm. Like, that talent has to be uh, pulled somewhere where people can see these guys still play. And, you know, doing the half-court game to me was a no-brainer. It's something we all... Everybody in here probably played more three on three than five on five, mm-hmm. except y'all. But, but uh, growing up, growing up, that's mm-hmm. what you do, and and it's a great game. It's it's some of your most ferocious games are gonna be three on three, mm-hmm. you nowhere to hide. Thanks. You know, uh, so I said, man, why isn't this elevated to the professional level? I would love to see seven footers in that paint banging mm-hmm. like that. You know, that would be amazing. Uh, so. That's where it came. It came from being a fan of the game, wanting to see it continue for people that I, you know, spent decades, you know, shit, 15 years watching. You know what I'm saying? I want to keep watching till they say it's over. Because mm-hmm. the NBA could tell you it's over, but just because they, just because the NBA tell you it's over, it's not. that don't mean it's over. Right. It's over when you say it's over. Mm. This man right here retiring on his own terms. He mm-hmm. said done playing pro sports. That don't mean he ain't going to ball somewhere here and there. Right. But pro level, done mm-hmm. on his terms. And the reason I, I thank him for being the heart and soul of the big three, because at that combine, nobody knew. The first combine, 2017, nobody knew. What kind of league is this? Is this a pickup game, all-star kind of feel? We just kicking it? Is this you know, go out get there and check. chill, just get a check? Yeah. Get a couple shots of going to 50 half court. Ah, this is easy peasy. And Stax, he was like, yo, 
I ain't got no friends out here. <laughs> when I touch this ball, it's over. Don't come asking for no kind of take it easy. Nothing. Stop chilling. Stop. I don't want to hear that shit. And he walked around everybody like circling. I'm like, yeah, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> you know me, man. yeah. You know That's me, what man. I want to hear. You know me, man. And he got in there and he went at him hard. You know, just nothing dirty, just set hardcore the, the tone. playing. And everybody said, man, we got to bring it. You know, I seen eyes getting big. Al Catino, everybody you know, turned it up. It damn near was a fight. And then <laughs> and then you got you got Oakley. Rick Barry. Charles Oakley stopping the fight. I'm like, boy, we, we got, got some. We got Charles Oakley <laughs> jumping in saying, fellas, <laughs> fellas. I'm saying, shit, we got something, man. Mm. And if he didn't do that, Mm -hmm. Who knows what kind of start we would have got off to? Who right. knows if we would have actually turned this from a great idea into a real league Thanks. where pride and game is on the line, legacy on the line, and people still willing to put it out there. Mm -hmm. That meant a lot to me. I, uh, you can ask my, my, my fiance now. I took a picture of that message. I, I got a message from him. I think it was like late at night, and he was like, I just want to thank you for... Um, what you done for the league. It's like this league wouldn't be the way it is without you. And you know, that means a lot to us because I didn't get all the props I felt I deserve as an NBA player. Thanks. So to be a part of a league, a professional league, and to get that from our founder, that meant a lot to me, bro. I'm going to always give you props. Yeah. You know what I mean? You yeah. got carte blanche to this league, and we're going to grow the league, yeah. and we all going to, you know, sit back and think about who was there at the beginning, mm -hmm. who. Dudes didn't have to stick, they. Game, legacy, next, mm -hmm. or anything on the line for, you know, brother with an idea trying to make it work. I can't make it work by myself. Right. I need great athletes to buy into it, take it serious, mm -hmm. and and play to win. That's all I ask for, you know. I'll, I'll pay. Just, <laughs> just come to don't win hard, and not right. just, don't play just to play. Nobody right. wants to see that shit. Mm -mm. Come to win. Mm -hmm. Shout out Jeff. Yeah, my man Jeff Quantinitz, we thought of this together. We brainstormed for a year, argued over rules, mm -hmm. um, and you know how we was gonna treat the players in the league, and and uh, it's been a dream come true. We need to get all the smokers one of the big three sponsors. Hell yeah! Showtime, man, please. Showtime, Showtime. basketball. Just, yeah, all right, y'all yeah, got the contract. <laughs> be right there. Be here, man. Let's make it happen. Hey, so you guys took a hiatus, obviously with COVID. You're returning. Tell us about your return this year. Are uh, we back this year? Yes, sir. Um, now we've uh, looked at our sport. You know, the youngsters start calling it fireball, the fireball way we play. Great. Yep. So we've decided to lean into that. Oh, okay. And Dope. you know, this is not your grandfather's three on three. Right. You know what I'm saying? This is a whole different sports. Like you got boxing, and you got UFC. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? You know. You got the NBA plays basketball. Mm -hmm. The big three plays fireball three. Mm -hmm. And it's a different game, and it got its own wrinkles that may not be, you know, with traditional basketball. And we wanted to be able to start to make our own superstars. Mm -hmm. um, so we're getting younger this year. We letting um, players as young as 22. Uh, join the league, and we also are having an open tryout, um, and we'll invite ten players to our combine. Mm. And Nate, you get in the When's combine, the you got a chance. When's the tryout? So everybody know we working it out. You okay. know, hopefully we can get it up. Um, looking at middle of May. Okay. Um, two different cities. We'll make the announcement for the ballers that's out there that want to give it a shot, and it's gonna be. Our coaches and captains picking who mm -hmm. get to go to the combine, but okay. ten players will get a chance to compete in the combine. And if you get to the combine, you know, stack, yep. you might make a team. Mm. Might make a team. You mm. might make a team. So that's unique mm -hmm. in sports. It gives you know athletes out there who are might not be great, you know, on the full court NBA level, but might be the perfect yeah. mm -hmm. fireball three. 
ballers. You know what I'm saying? Big three ballers. So, so, wait, so is it wait, is it going to be called Fireball Three now? Or what, the name of the it? game is called Fireball, Fireball Three. Okay. But it's still the league the is still the big got three. You, got you. Got uh, you. I yeah. mean, what, the homie uh, Frank Nitty. Uh, Frank Nitty. Yeah, yeah, Frank like, Nitty. Yeah. You know, he was a Drew League legend. Yes. You know what I mean, it never really got a chance in the league real life, but through your Big three got an NBA tryout. That's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. You know, uh, we not stopping any of those dreams. You know, we want to give these guys a platform mm-hmm. where they can show, look, I can play at this level. Just yeah. give me a chance. You got Joe Johnson another run in the league. Yeah, you know, and that's what it's all about. You know, we welcome that. It gives our league credibility. Right. People think, you know, well, I don't have to just go to the G League. I can, you know, the big three this guys. a stepping stone, too. You know, games. On CBS, you know what mm. I mean? I could be seen every Saturday on CBS. Mm. If I, That's if what a lot of people out. don't know, though. You, you like a lot of basketball players financially and mentally were at a place where they had nowhere to go. And that big three saved a lot of them. I know, you know, it's, it's not our position to say names, but I know a lot of people that then came to me and gave me words that should have been directed to you. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean, man? I'm glad this league here, man. You, bro, you, don't, you know, having real conversations because mm. I didn't been around. Mm. Man, you don't know where I was last week, bro. This, you know, this 10 racks a week helping me, bro. Mm. Baby mama, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So mm-hmm. I got a, a lot Straight of players up. might not say it to you, mm-hmm. but you're saving lives, bro. Oh, man, you changed. That's it. what it's all about, too, man. I, I look at myself as a, <clears throat> you know, a rap. I, I do movies. <clears throat> but if somebody came to me at 35, 36, it's like, cute, it's over, man. No more records, no more movies, you're done. You're out the league. Mm. Like, how would that make me feel? Right. You know what I'm saying? When you know you still got more in the tank. Mm-hmm. You still, you know you can out rap all these, yeah. you know, yeah. youngsters coming up. And you know you can still act, you know, uh, with the best of them. So, you know, that. how would that make me feel? And I just have that sympathy for the athletes that we love we cherish we cheer we these are our heroes and we let them down at the end of the at the end of their career and treat them like they that they never played the game man and it's yep. it's uh you know not no more you know you got a home you can come to the big three if you still yep. got game you can make a squad come on yep. I, mean, I think it was perfect for my brother you know obviously jack's nba career ended before it should have you yes. know what I mean? And he fought his ass to try to get back and shit didn't work. So that, to me, as a friend, seeing him go and do what he did in the big three and get to leave on his own terms, like, okay. that shit was dope to me. Yeah, okay. That's what it's all about. Mm-hmm. It's all about knowing I, I'm done. I can watch now. Right. I, I don't I don't care if I touch that ball mm-hmm. or not. <laughs> you know all what right. I'm saying? Worse to be sitting there with the itch, thinking, yep. oh, man, I wish I was out there. But what other league did I know that I, me, person, Stevie Jackson, can walk away as a leading scorer, then walking straight into a coach position. I don't know no other league, mm-hmm. so you know what I'm saying? That's why, I, that's why I didn't mind giving my all to it, because I know from day one, the first thing he told us, take care this league gonna only be what we make it. Mm. Yes. You know what I mean? And it was, it was a lot of players that didn't understand that at the time. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? But the core guys understood that, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And it's still like that. Yep. We, still got a, we still got a lot of opposition. Yep. A, lot of, a lot of people want to only play with the big boys. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we like, look, we coming. We 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 some of the most exciting basketball in the summer, and you know it, it takes everybody. It takes all hands on deck to continue to 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 blow this league up. Yeah. Mm, straight up. Outside of the Lakers, thoughts on teams and players you kind of get when you get some time. You you like to check out. Man, Dame Lillard. Mm, everybody. God mm. damn. <laughs> I love his game. Mm-hmm. I love his attitude. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know he's what. Is what you want, you yeah, know what I mean? Mm-hmm. He's he's like y'all. You want the soldier? Yeah, you don't want nobody in there all friendly, friendly. You know what I'm saying? Time you want war? Yeah, you want that, you know, gunfighter. Yeah, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? Like I, I come in to seek and destroy. I don't come <laughs> in to <laughs> bring them all. Know? Yeah. So when I see those type of players, you know, they become my favorite athletes when they got game over the ones who are just, you know, nice to everybody and. <laughs> you don't know if they care if they win or not. Yeah. Would the Lakers repeat, you think? I think we got what it takes to repeat if we healthy. Health. It's all about health. Um, but it's cool that these youngsters and uh, these new players are getting a chance to play yeah. without uh, LeBron and, and AD and win. You know, they showing like, yo, we, we Lakers too. It ain't all yeah. about them two players. So I think that's going to help us in the long Absolutely. run. 
But you know, Brooklyn is they look mm, tough, man. Enough. You know, they they done stacked up. And we'll see. Mm, health is key. Yeah. Thoughts on how you fell in love. Obviously, you started early, but you fell in love with the game in the early 80s. Obviously, a very physical, defensive-minded game. To see what it is from there to how it's 130, 40-point games and barely any defense. Thoughts on kind of the evolution of the NBA? I like a a, a strong competitive game. You know, I like, you know, regular season NBA games are okay. Playoff games to me is what's what it's all about. You really get to see, you know, the nitty guys getting down to the nitty gritty and giving that extra effort on defense. You know, um, but it, it it is you know strange sometimes because I remember hearing like no layups in the playoffs and actually seeing it. But it meant that <laughs> it meant that mm-hmm. like you go in there for a layup, man. You better have your gun mm-hmm. out. <laughs> <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? So to see dudes just glide to the rack, you know, it's different. like with nobody really, you know, challenging hard. Um, that's why I let certain things go on in my league. You know, not, I don't want hard fouls at the y'all rim, get, y'all get but I do though. want, um, you know, the hand checking and letting guys actually play defense and mm-hmm. stay in front of a guy and, I think that's important, you know. Nobody want to see, you know, a hundred and fifty point game every every time out. Mm-hmm. You know? Recently, the, the 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 great DMX is hospitalized. You posted a studio session with him. Obviously, we're all sending our prayers to him. How special was he as an artist? I mean, he was one of the greatest to ever touch the mic. At his height, he was as big as any rapper out there, mm-hmm. was selling five and six million copies. Um, I got a chance to work with him early before he even like blew up. I think before he even had his first, might have had one record on the radio. Um, I was doing a We Be Clubbing remix. Mm-hmm. DJ Clark Kent, shout out Clark Kent, the homie. He uh, he was like, "All right, Cube, who you want? I can get anybody in New York on this. Who you want?" And I was like, "Man, I'm hearing about this young kid I heard on the radio, man, named DMX." He's like, yeah, I know you're talking about. Mm. He said, you want him? I said, yeah. He said, all right, I get him. He went, got DMX. DMX was like, man, thank you. Thank you for putting me down. You know what I'm saying? And then we did the track. It was bananas. And um, I flew him and the Rough Riders out to shoot the video. Mm. You know, I remember meeting Eve before she was even a star. You know, she Mm -hmm. was just part of the Rough Rider crew just hanging out. So just seeing him blow up and do movies and mm-hmm. um, and then, you know, go through his issues and then hear his backstory on, Crazy. you know, old, you know, dirty ass, oh, you know. Fake ass. Yeah, okay. you know, got him hooked on that shit. So, um, you know, I, I still... You know, hope for the best, wish for the best, believe he's going to pull through and be the same old DMX he always been. So I'm praying for him. Absolutely. Sending love and prayers to the family. Mount Rushmore. Yeah. You, E-40, Too Short, Snoop Dogg. Mm. Can't wait. We waiting on it. Yeah, man, we we got to, we done did so many dope records. Like, we got shit in the can. You know, we arguing on which one's coming out first, which, you know. So it's fun. It's fun being a part of something that's, you know, building in anticipation and 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 know that we got good music. It's not just, you know, hype. Mm-hmm. So we know we got the shit and mm-hmm. we know people want it. That's now cool. it's just about, you know, we doing stuff, getting our visuals together, photo shoots, videos. We just want to be cocked and loaded before we mm-hmm. drop the bomb. I might as well go and drop a big, a big three song. Well, you know, we got a song that I that I cut together. We did a song called "Locked In." Mm-hmm. I we, heard it. We we done cut it to the big three stuff. Yeah, so I heard maybe that'll hold throughout the whole summer. If not, we'll we'll do something new. Yeah, we had uh forty and uh short on the show, and they their excitement was they was ready. Yeah, they man. Ready. You know, everybody <laughs> is rejuvenated and excited, and we know this is an epic project, mm-hmm. and we plan to do. You know, multiple records. Will Dre make a make an appearance? Yeah, he on the song. He on one of those songs yeah. called I think it's called Block Cowboy. So Yes, sir. Yeah, you know, 
whenever you get to dock on it, you take it to another level. If you were going to create the best big three player from the past or present, who would it be? I think a player like, you know, damn, past or pre- man, come on, Ooh, man. Come on, man. Too many ballers out there. But, you know, if you had a game, you know, a person like Scottie Pippen mm. who can do it all long, um, you know, he's a damn near a smaller version of Giannis. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah, Pip was cold. And, and, yeah, he got that that kind of athleticism. I think he would, you know, any player like that would be great in the league because you got to have all your skills, you know. Anything you weak at, it's going to show. It's right. definitely going to get exposed. You know, it's like that's why some players that did great in the NBA didn't do so well in the big three yep. because yep. anything that you weak at, you gonna, gonna it's going to be exposed. What I loved was I introduced my twins to it at the time, and they want to say they were eight or nine, and we watched a handful of games, actually watched the playoff run, and then the next season they're watching it without me. Kids you know love the I mean? big three Absolutely. Um, because they play they play three on three mm-hmm. when they get to school. Mm-hmm. You or at know the what house I'm saying? With their yeah, they, they don't, got, they don't have playing. enough room to play tens. Yep, five and three on three. Our games are fast. You know, you can see a big a game in an hour mm-hmm. or less. You know, our games are usually about thirty five and fifty five minutes per game. So, you know, you ain't sitting there three hours, and there's no. There's no garbage minutes because there are no minutes. You got to play. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> you know, you buckets yeah, or not. Buckets, straight up. You know, so everybody play from start to finish without no, oh, we're about to win this so I can mm-hmm. kick back. None of that. I've seen a team have uh, 48 to 37 and lose. Took the foot off the gas. Yeah. And lose. Yeah. It's crazy. You know, it's, you got to keep playing till you get 50 or more. Real quick, I mean, I'm I'm such a huge fan, and this is not on the last part, but any Pac stories that stand out to you, working with him, getting to know him? I hung out with him mostly when he was with Digital. Mm, before. And uh, before he started going solo, and I just remember he was a ball of energy. He, uh, he was just a fun dude to hang around. You know, one of those dudes that was like the life of the party. You know, you'd hear him coming a mile away. We had did a show somewhere in the Bay Area, and it's like, got to be three in the morning, four. Like, everybody done, done shut it down. You know what I mean? Been partying all night and shut it down. Pac's still up, come knocking on my door. You sleep? Man, fuck that. Get dressed. Get dressed. We're going downstairs, man. We're going to keep this going. I'm like, Pac, homie, <laughs> I'm tired, man. I'm tired. I'm like, man, I never get tired. He fucked with me for about 20 minutes at the door. Just won't leave. I'm like, man, I ain't going down there, man. And then, you know, I just see him just, you know, like, I'm gone. I'm, I'm, I'll tell you how I was. And just bouncing off the walls. And I'm like, man, this dude's having a ball with this shit. Yeah. So, you know, Pac was one of those dudes who, you know, people knew him on one level, but you know, you get him one on one, and you realize you're dealing with a smart, humble dude. Mm. You know what I mean? And that's what I remember about him. You know, it was like you always was happy to see him coming. You know what I'm saying? When Pac was around, we was we'd be up at Echo Sound doing records. Pac was doing his solo album. I remember he he started driving and shit. He'm like, man, I wrecked this, I wrecked his Benz two or three times. It's like, man, I didn't drive when I was young. We didn't. We didn't drive on the East Coast at all. So got to the West Coast. I ain't worried about driving. I'm like, man, don't kill yourself in that damn thing. <laughs> so I just remember him being uh just a good dude. He was always loving what we was doing. Cause he was he was sitting me like, man, I do my solo shit, man. I wanna make records. I wanna make them kind of records about the hood like y'all do, because mm. it's ill where I live, man. It's crazy where I live and don't nobody know. I need to talk to, I need to tell people about that shit. Like, man, I, I would just encourage him, like, you gotta do what you feel, or it ain't gonna, you ain't gonna be happy with it. But ain't, it, ain't that crazy? I mean, obviously that's Pac and that's a million more people. Just the inspiration you gave the everyday person that looked like you and looked in your neighborhood, the inspiration you gave them. It's a blessing, you know, because I, I was giving that same inspiration from other, 
you know, MCs or people that, you know, showed me the way. You know, Ice-T was a great mentor, you know, for young MC trying to figure it out because he had went through a lot of stuff um, with, with, with his lyrics, and he gave me the best advice any MC ever gave me, which was... Um, don't rap it if you don't if you can't explain it. Like don't don't just be rhyming shit. Mm. Like know what you're talking about because they're gonna ask you about it. You want to know every line. You want to know why you wrote it, what it mean to you, and so you can intelligently explain yourself when they come at you about them because they coming at you. And you did that. Yeah. So that was great advice mm -hmm. because you know as a rapper you just trying to rhyme. Clever shit. It's slick talk. You know what I mean? Slick talking. But when you start getting into the political areas, you have to know what you're doing and know what you're saying and know what you're talking about. All time NBA starting five. Ice Cube starting five. All time. Damn. At guard, I got magic. Oof. Lord. Because you could do it with Lakers alone. Yeah, I probably should. <laughs> at the two, I got Kobe. Mm -hmm. At the three, I got LeBron. Mm -hmm. At the four, wow, I got uh, Tim Duncan. Mm. At the five, I got Shaq. Mm, it's tough. It's not losing very many. <laughs> not at all. That's when you finish. Yep. Uh, five dinner guests, dead or alive. You plus five around the table for dinner. The homie, uh, Crazy Tunes, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Um, my grandfather, rest in peace. My grandmother, rest in peace. Um, John Singleton. I mean, I lost a lot of homies, but for people that know people, give me Weatherspoon. If you could pick a guest for us to have on All The Smoke, who would it be? But you have to help us get this guest on. That's the part. Y'all tell me which one y'all want. I mean, uh, I'm hearing all uh, these uh, names. Uh, man. Chris Tucker. Yeah. You got a lot of names now. Uh, Ice T, you said a lot of people now. Did y'all have Kevin Hart on here? No, no, no bam. No. Ooh, that's a good That's what one. we need. Kevin Hart. Y'all are funny. That's what we need, y'all are boy. Y'all are funny duo. <laughs> <Y 'all are laughs> funny yeah. duo. Oh, that would be like. Hey man, that's a wrap. Ice Cube, man, we appreciate hey, your man, time, G, brother. Thank you. Love, it was an honor. Y'all got to have yes, me back, sir. man. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Man, man, you can catch us on Showtime Basketball YouTube and the iHeart platform, Black Effects. See y'all next week. Big three. Yay, yay. Right now, you only 10 days old. My little dog. Ain't nobody touching this. I'm more than ready to be the king of the division. I have to figure out how to take Brian Castano away from being Brian Castano. This is the real deal here. All access to Mel Charlo versus Brian Castano, Friday, July 9th at 8.30 on Showtime.